Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. You know, there's a few reasons why I'm excited this morning. Number one, I'm excited to be here with you as I am every Sabbath. Praise the Lord, it never gets old. Number two, I'm excited with where this church has been these past few months. Have you sensed it? With all the evangelism that we've been doing, the Bible studies that you have been giving, Unlock Revelation that you put on. This is a lay-led church with some beautiful leaders. I just want to thank you guys so much for working hard. It is definitely shown. Number three, another reason why I'm excited today is pretty obvious. My fiance is here. I told her I wasn't going to embarrass her, but I'm going to. Could you stand up real quick, Dakota? I haven't seen her in about six months, so it's good to finally have her here. Um, she, I, I moved into my apartment a few weeks ago, and... Um, I'm a bachelor, so you can imagine the state that it was in. And uh, she came, and she saw the apartment, and she shook her head, and I wrote this morning's message, and now my apartment looks like a home again. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Dakota. You know, this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about the children of Israel. But before we do, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this day that you've given us, truly a day of rest. Holy rest, Father. As we come today and we look at what your word has to say, I ask that these would not be my words, but that they would be yours. Father, there may be some here that are convicted. There may be some here that fall upon the rock, which is you. But I ask that you would bring us all in a closer unity so that you may come sooner. In your precious name, amen. You know, I told you that I was excited about what this church has been doing, and it's been fantastic. But let me ask you this question. Do you think we're perfect yet as a church family? What do you think? Do you think that we still have room for improvement? What do you think? Absolutely, we still have room for improvement. We have a lot of room for improvement. You know, this morning, we've had success, but we can have better success. And today, I'd like to share with you some tips and some reasons how the children of Israel had better success than they had before. You know, Moses, he was an interesting character, wasn't he? He lost his temper at times. He was raised in Egypt. His mother raised him as a child, which we'll look at a little bit this morning. But today I'd like to understand and have you understand as well that the reason that this church has been succeeding isn't because of your Bible worker, but it's because of Jesus Christ. Amen? How many of you have grown closer to Jesus through prayer? You know, the best way that this church can be united together is if you are more united with Jesus Christ. Amen? Because the more that you grow closer to Jesus Christ, the more that you are going to change for the better. And the more that I grow closer to Jesus Christ, the more that I'm going to change for the better. And when we meet together, guess what? We're going to be one and the same. Amen? We may have different personalities, but we're all going to have the same beliefs and we're going to have the same goals, which is hastening Christ's soon coming. How many of you are excited for Jesus to come? I'm about ready. How about you? With what's been happening in Dallas this past week, that was tragic, was it not? I'm tired of it. I'm ready to go home. This morning, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Exodus, Exodus chapter 2. And forgive me, this isn't my normal Bible. It's in the rebinding shop, and so I'm not as familiar with this one. Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2, we're going to start here in verse 1. Exodus chapter 2, starting here in verse 1. I'll be ringing out of the King James this morning. And it says this, And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw that he was a goodly child, she hid him for three months. Why did she hide this boy? Because of Pharaoh, right? How many of you remember the story? Pharaoh was going to kill all of the sons, and she didn't want her son to be killed, so of course she hid him. And in verse 3, And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes, daubed it with slime and with pitch, and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags, or the reeds, by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to watch what would be done with him. This is a very humble beginning, isn't it? This child was born, and he already had a price on his head. 
He would have been killed if the soldiers would have found him. And so he was hidden away. He was kept down. His mother loved him so much. But when he got a little bit older, about three months old, he started to get more boisterous. He started to get more noisy. And so they had to do something. So they put him in his little ark, as you guys know the story. But continuing on here in verse 5. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. There's Miriam. She's supposed to be watching over her brother. And the Pharaoh's wife is there washing herself, and she picks up this little baby boy. You think Miriam's heart sank a little bit? She thought for sure that her baby brother was doomed. But this woman had a soft heart. Maybe Moses looked cute, as I'm sure all babies do. She scooped up this baby with her maids. And notice what she says here in verse 6. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby cried. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. Then said his sister to the Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to you a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give you wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. Can you imagine getting paid to take care of her own son? What do you think that she taught Moses during that time period that she had him? As much as she could. You know, in this church today, there are young people. Not just teenagers, not just young adults, but there's young people. Be careful what you say around these young people. Be careful what you tell these young people. Be careful what you teach these young people. Because sooner than later, they're going to be the ones that are up here. They're the future of this church. So we have this young person, verse 10, the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, and she said, because I drew him up out of the water. So here's Moses, he's just weaned, so he's still little, and he starts to become indoctrinated in all the ways of Egypt. Egypt was the biggest and the best country at that time, that kingdom in the world, and he started to become educated. Acts will tell us later on that Moses was educated in the ways of a general. He was educated in battle. He was educated in science. He was educated in the religion of the Egyptians. And believe it or not, Moses was brilliant. He was the prince of Egypt. In fact, he was heir to the throne. Did he have a high position? Did he have everything going for him? Absolutely, it seemed like it. But God still had a plan for this baby boy, did he not? You know, this morning you may have children, you may have family members, I know that I have family members, that seem like they're out in the world. They're outside of this church, they're outside of the walk from God, most importantly. They're outside of their walk from God and they're being educated by the way of the Egyptians. Is there still hope for them? Do you believe that there's still hope for them? Absolutely, there's still hope for them. Continuing on here, let's turn to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7 here and verse 22. Let's start in verse 20. Acts chapter 7 and verse 20. It says this, In which time Moses was born, and was exceedingly fair, and nourished up in his father's house for three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and in deeds. So Moses, he basically had his PhD in Egyptian everything. He was a smart man. He had everything going for him. And then he decided one day, these aren't my people. I need to save God's chosen people. I'm going to be their leader. Now, Moses was used to getting all of the praise, was he not? He was worshipped almost as a god. But notice here what Councils to Parents and Teachers says on page 406. The education received by Moses as the king's grandson was very thorough. Nothing was neglected that would make him a wise man as the Egyptians understood wisdom. Moses supposed that his education in the wisdom of Egypt fully qualified him to lead Israel from bondage. 
He was ready and he knew it. Was he not learned in all those things necessary for a general of armies? Had he not had the advantages of the best schools in the land? Yes, he felt that he was able to deliver his people. He set about his work trying to gain the favor by redressing their wrongs. He killed an Egyptian who was imposing one of the Israelites. In this, he manifested the spirit of him who was a murderer from the beginning and proved himself unfit to represent the God of mercy, love, and tenderness. Moses failed. Although he had all of the education that the then known modern world could get him, Moses failed miserably to be a leader of Israel. So what did he do? He ran away, but God still had a plan for this man. He ran away and he went to the wilderness, and when he was in the wilderness here, he did something that was pretty incredible. He became a shepherd. A shepherd. Moses was fit to be a general. Moses was fit to be a king. But yet the Lord called him to be a shepherd for 40 years. You know, with the time that Moses was in the wilderness as a shepherd alone for 40 years, and the time that he was leading the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, Moses was in the wilderness for 80 years. That's a long time. That's like four times my life. That's a really long time. Why did God choose for him to go into the wilderness? Acts chapter 7, we're already there. Acts chapter 7 and verse 30 says this, And when 40 years were expired, he was in the wilderness there, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. Moses was there. He was tending his sheep for 40 years. What did Moses learn? I don't think the question is, what did Moses learn? The question is, what did Moses unlearn? Education is extremely important, is it not? Do you think that your children should be educated? Absolutely. Do you think that you should be educated? Definitely. There's something to be said for a Christian education. Amen? There's something to be said for an Adventist education, is there not? If Moses would have been trained in this education of a true Christian, if he would have been homeschooled, if he would have been put in the church school, maybe something would have been different. Because our schools just don't teach math and reading and writing and arithmetic. Well, I guess math and arithmetic are the same thing. I guess I should go back to school. But they don't teach that, but they also teach something that's extremely important, and that is a walk with Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Amen? We should never underestimate that. We should always be teaching our children that they need, above all the other things, to have a walk with Jesus Christ. Because what is success to a young person? Is success having a PhD when they're going to be lost for eternity? Is success having a master's and being lost? Yes, those things are important. But a firm relationship with Jesus Christ is important for eternity. Amen? Moses, there in the desert, unlearned all of the garbage, if you will, that he learned in Egypt. But not only did he unlearn all of this garbage, but he started to walk closer to the one that he created him. Being a shepherd there in the middle of the desert, if you've been around sheep for very long, you'll figure out that sheep are pretty dumb animals. If you knock over a sheep on its back, some of them can't even get up. They'll just stay there until they die. Moses went from a very esteemed job all the way down to being a shepherd. That's really expensive wool if you think about it. Was Moses at rock bottom? How many of you have ever experienced rock bottom before? It's not, very a, fun, it's not a very fun thing, is it? But yet sometimes we experience rock bottom so that we can experience our weakness so that God can strengthen us. Amen? Amen? And for some of us, like Moses, it may take 40 years. So Moses here, he's in the wilderness. And as he's in this wilderness, at the end of the 40 years, look what happens in Exodus. Go back to Exodus. Exodus chapter 3.
Exodus chapter 3, starting here in verse 1. He's at the end of this 40 years, and look what happens. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. By the way, these weren't even Moses' sheep. They were his father-in-law's. <laughs> even more humbling still. The priest of Median, and led the flock to the backside of the desert, and came to the mount of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared in him a flame out of fire in the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Who appeared to God in this burning bush? Who appeared to Moses in this burning bush? Did I tell you the answer? God appeared to Moses out of this burning bush. Amen? And what did Moses go on to do? He went on to lead his people out of captivity. Amen? Did Moses make mistakes? Absolutely he made mistakes, but yet God could still use him. Out of this same book, Counsels to Parents and Teachers, it says, Moses had been taught to expect flattery and praise from his superior abilities. Now he was to learn a different lesson. As a shepherd of sheep, Moses learned to care for the afflicted, to nurse the sick, to seek patiently after the strain, to bear long with the unruly, to supply with loving solitude the wants of young lambs and the necessities of the old and feeble. In this experience, he was drawn nearer to the chief shepherd. Is this the experience that we want, no matter what it takes? So, point number one that I want us to learn from this story today is although we might have education, although we might have organization, we might have all these things which will be useful, however, it is not, none of that is as useful as his reliance on Jesus Christ. Amen? We need more relying on Jesus Christ than we do education, although education is very important. Let's rely more on him. Our second and our last point today we're going to go to Joshua chapter 7. Still tracking along with the Israelites, although we're making quite a leap here. Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7 here in verse 1 where our scripture reading was. Joshua chapter 7 and verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. Just a little bit of context. Jericho had just been defeated. They were triumphant, right? The Israelites came. They marched around Jericho's walls. The walls came down. They were triumphant. And God was very specific. God said, you have conquered Jericho because of me. And because you have conquered Jericho because of me, there's one thing that I want you to do. Just this one thing. It's very simple. I don't want you to take any of the spoils, any of the money, any of the goods from Jericho. Don't take any of it, all right? Pretty simple, don't you think? But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing. So Achan decided that that maybe didn't apply to him, or maybe it just looked really good to him. I don't know his reasoning, but he decided to disobey God. He took some things, which we'll find out what they are later, he took some things and he went and he buried them in the bottom of his tent. And then take a look at this. The Israelites, they're on their, they're on their conquest and they see in the distance some other people that need to be conquered. In verse 3 it says this, They returned to Joshua some spies. The spies returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite my eye. And make not all the people labor there, for they are just but a few. Joshua says, okay, there's just a few people over there. We just conquered Jericho. It won't be that much for God. Go let some people go. So two or 3,000 people went, and guess what happened? They were defeated. Here in verse 5, And the men of Ai smote of them about 36 men. They chased them from before the gate, even to Sheribram, and smote them in going down. Wherefore the hearts of people melted and became as water. They had just become so triumphant in Jericho, and then they went to go fight this small battle. They didn't put a lot of effort into it, and they were defeated. Can God ever be defeated? Let me ask you the question. Can God be defeated? No, absolutely not. God cannot be defeated, but his people can be defeated if they distance himself, themselves from him. And this is what happened with the Israelites here. 
because just one man in the whole Israelite camp had sinned, because one man took just a few things and put them in the bottom of his tent, the whole camp of, of the Israelites suffered. Because this one man had sinned, he caused 36 men to be killed in battle. So Joshua, he doesn't know what happened here. Why did we get defeated? And so he rips his clothes and he starts praying. He said, Lord, there's a few things wrong here. Number one, we were defeated, and I don't know why. Number two, people know that you were our God. And because we were defeated, that goes on your name. It tarnished your name. Brothers and sisters, when we fail... When we distance ourselves from God and we disrespect his name and we are defeated by the enemy, that doesn't just affect you. That doesn't just affect your name, but whose name does it affect? The name of the one that you profess to worship. You're not just a representative of the Morgan family. You're not just a representative of your family, but you are a representative of Christ's family. Amen? Sharing the gospel message with other people is a great thing. Handing out glow tracks, giving Bible studies, it's a fantastic thing. But with that comes a great responsibility. When you start giving Bible studies to somebody, when you start mentoring somebody, when you start befriending somebody and leading them closer to Christ, they're looking at you. Are they not? They're watching you. Every step that you make matters to them. And if you do something and if you stumble, then that person will say, oh, then it must be okay for me to do as well. Now, that means that, we're gonna, that we are going to make mistakes, right? But let's make sure that we always repent to the one who can forgive that mistake, and that is Jesus Christ. With this witnessing comes a great responsibility. So Joshua, he prays and says, Lord, what's going on? And God told him, he said, somebody took something from Jericho. Now, Achan knew it was him, didn't he not? Obviously, Achan knew. Could Achan have come forward right then and said, it was me? Absolutely. But as you continue to read on, we won't read this morning, but as you read on, we see that they have to, take, they have to basically break it down into little sections. So they take the tribe of Judah, and all of them come forward. Then they take another family, and then out of that family, until finally, Achan is singled out, and he's caught. He admits to his, he admits to his sin, but I'm not sure if he repented of it. He admits to being caught. So take a look here at what Achan had taken. We find this here in Joshua chapter 7 and verse 20 and 21. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I've done. When I saw amongst the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold to 50 shekels weight, I coveted them took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the middle of my tent, and the silver under it. For just a little bit of money, for a couple pairs of clothes, Achan sinned, and because of that little bit, 36 soldiers, 36 children of God paid for that. My question to you this morning is this, what's under your tent? What's under your tent? It may not be a few shekels of silver and gold. It's probably not a Babylonian garment. But what's under your tent? What have we not surrendered to the Lord that we are cherishing and holding on to? When we're supposed to surrender to Jesus, it doesn't mean that we just give 99.9% .9 of it. When we have one thing behind us that we're grasping onto. When we surrender to Jesus, it means we need to have open palms, right? He needs to take how much? He needs to take it all. So this morning, I'm asking you, what's under your tent? You know, if you have that cherished sin in your life, if you have that thing hiding that maybe nobody knows about, it might affect somebody else. It's not just going to affect you. It will affect somebody else. You know, there's a lot of people here this morning and I love all of you, and I know most of you by name, and I know most of you personally.
But with all of these people being here, with me being here, even makes the chance bigger, there's a chance that a lot of us have something in our tents. There's a chance that I have something in my tent that's buried, that's deep, that nobody knows about, but yet I'm holding on to it. What is that? I'm not asking you to tell me what that little cherished sin is this morning. I'm not asking you to say, raise your hand and say, I'm struggling with this. That's not, that's not my place to know. That's between you and God. When you leave this place today and you're thinking about what may be under your tent, can you do me a favor? Try getting on your knees. You know, it's really, really, God, it's really, really hard for God to answer your prayers if you never pray to him. God's waiting to take that from you. That thing may be hard to give up. It may, it, may, it may come with the struggle, but he's willing to be patient. He's willing to guide you along. He's willing to be there for you, just like that shepherd. So I'm asking you, what's under your tent? Do I like sports too much? On Wednesday night when it's prayer meeting, on Tuesday night when it's time to give a Bible study and the NBA finals are on, or the Super Bowl is on, do I cancel that so I can watch the football or basketball game rather than go to prayer meeting? Rather than going sharing Christ? That's, some, that's, that's something I need to ask myself. Is there something that we put in the place of God? You know, the Sabbath is important. The Sabbath is important because we give it to the Lord, amen? It's a time that we honor Him. There's nothing special about the day per se itself, but it's special because God sanctified that for us, amen? That's what He wants with our lives. God doesn't want to just make one day holy, but He wants to make your life holy. So I'm asking you this morning, what is under your tent? Turn with me for our last verse this morning to John. John chapter 15. This is Jesus talking here. And as most of you know, I grew up on a, on a cherry farm, cherry, a little cherry orchard, not the biggest in the world, but I know a few things about, a little bit about farming. If you have, if you have a tree, if you have a vine, and you break off a branch from that tree, what happens? to that vine that you broke away. It's going to die, is it not? The leaves are going to wither. It's not going to have any fruit. But come pruning season, when they're, when they're pruning that tree, sometimes they don't cut all the way and they move on. And that branch that was supposed to be cut off of the tree, sometimes it's hanging just by a few threads. It's just kind of, it's just kind of hanging there. It's, it's connected, but just barely. You can walk by a few months later, and although it's just hanging on a little bit, there's still a little piece of life in that branch. Now let's read John 15. Jesus is saying, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you, except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do how much? You can do nothing. The fact that this church has brought forth some good fruit. We've had this baptismal tank full. We've had smiles on our faces. We've done good things for the community. That's proof that this church is connected to Jesus. Amen? But let me ask you the question. Shouldn't that tank be full every week? Shouldn't there be more people in this pew? On these pews? Maybe the problem with this church isn't that we're not a great church, but maybe it is that some of us have something in our tents. There's not really a whole lot more that I can say. 
But the continuation of this sermon is this. After this message, once potluck is over, once you go home, if you have kids, once the kids are in bed, take some time with your father. Do some soul searching. Ask the Lord, is there something in me that I need to give up? Maybe there's something obvious that you know you need to give up today. But ask the Lord, is there something that I need to get out of my tent? And here's another tip. Don't do it on your own. Don't say, I'm just going to take this thing out and I'm going to throw it away and I'm never going to do it before because guess what? You're going to fail every time. When you take that thing and you give it to God, maybe your hands are shaking Say, Lord, please take it and help me to find something better to fill that hole with. And I guarantee that God will give you something far better that could fulfill your wildest dreams. So how many of you will join me in making sure that our tents are clean? We do some soul searching this week. Because I guarantee that if we do some soul searching, we'll become unified. And this church, although it's doing well already, this movement, although it's doing well already, will be even greater. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you in humbleness. We come to you in repentance. There's sometimes things in our lives that we need to get rid of, maybe things that we don't even know. But as we grow closer to you, we realize that there's more and more deep-rooted in us that we need to give up. Father, bless us. Be with each member here in this church. Be with myself. Be with the pastoral staff, Father, that we as well will find things that we need to give up for you. Fill us, Father, in your precious name. Amen.